Mm-hmm. You're okay. okay. Right. So today is a very significant day in the history of the church, the 24th of August. Uh, two significant events occurred on the 24th of August, and neither one of them were very positive. Uh, first of all, uh, in 1572, on the 24th of August, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre occurred. And the French Huguenots or French Protestants were slaughtered. And there was a tremendous massacre. And then in 1662, uh, which they called Black Bartholomew's Day, there was what was known as the Great Ejection from the Church of England. And any, uh, you would say, evangelical minister was basically, if they didn't subscribe to the act of uniformity to kind of follow the Anglican way of doing things, they were literally kicked out of their uh, church. And uh, over 2,000 British preachers uh, found themselves without a job, not just without a job, uh, but they couldn't come within five miles of the church that they had shepherded. (laughs) They um, couldn't go to Oxford or university or their children go to Oxford or Cambridge University because it was all Anglican. And uh, it was what we be- we call the nonconformist movement. Uh, those that did not conform, they were literally kicked out. So interesting day. We're not going to speak about it. either one of those topics today, but I just thought it is really an interesting day in church history, but it's not unrelated to our topic. I want to speak uh, just for a short while on William Williams of Panticellin. And William Williams of Panticellin actually is the author of the hymn that uh, was just sung to us, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. In fact, he was a great uh, hymn writer of the Welsh Revival. Uh, We don't sing too many of his hymns because most of them were written in Welsh. (laughs) And uh, you wouldn't even be able to read the Welsh, never mind sing the Welsh. And uh, But again, greatly used of God. When we think of... uh, this man, William Williams, we tend to think of him in connection with that hymn. In fact, that hymn is so popular that when Wales play rugby, the the crowd sing, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, bread of heaven, bread of feed me, so I want no more. And it's kind of amazing to hear 70, 80,000 people you know, who have no real interest in God whatsoever, it seems, but belting out uh, this hymn. So he's still well known in Wales, but he was part of three uh, great preachers who were part of what we call the Welsh Methodist Revival. We tend to think of the English Methodist Revival. We think of men like Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley. But at the same time, there was also a work of God going on in the Principality of Wales. And there were three preachers that stood out at that time. One was a guy called Howell Harris. And another one was a man called Daniel Rowland. And the third one was William Williams. And we want to kind of focus on Mr. Williams, although we will touch on the other two because his life was so interconnected with these other two individuals. Um, So, uh, We tend to think of him particularly in terms of hymns, but I want to suggest to you that, uh, again, we might say, what's this got to do with revival? And and it's simply this, that many of the great hymns that we sing today were born in revival times. And he was a man who was instrumental in a tremendous revival in the Principality of Wales. And of course, he was one of the, just like Charles Wesley was the songwriter who was associated with English Methodism, uh, well, uh, William Williams was very much connected with Welsh Methodism. So a little bit about his early life. He was born in 1717 um, on the 17th of February. And by the way, he, he, he died 11th of January, 1791. So 1717, 1791, this is his lifespan. But um, he was born at home. And I won't even attempt to pronounce the places uh, where he was born and all that, because they're all Welsh. Uh, But basically, uh, his father, John Williams, uh, was a freeholder. That means that uh, he actually owned the land. Most people that were farmers, uh, they they basically uh, were 
working for landlords who owned the land and then and would take a cut. But he was actually a freeholder, which would be work out quite well uh, in time for William Williams in terms of financing some of his labors. He was a freeholder. He was a, a ruling elder in a nonconformist church. Uh, and of, of course, uh, this was prior to, um, after 1662, but this particular church had been in existence since 1642. So they, they'd they even broken away from Anglicanism before the Great Ejection, 20 years before, before 1662. And um, his father is interesting. He, he married a woman who was 33 years his junior. So you talk about an age gap in marriage, uh, 33. His, so his mom and dad, 33 years gap between father and mother. And it's kind of interesting how that occurred. Um, his his mom, uh, she saw uh, this uh, man, John Williams, and he was uh, on his way uh, to court another woman in a different parish. And as he walked past the door of the lady that would become his wife, this woman, 33 years a junior, uh, she said to him, uh, obviously impressed by this serious-minded uh, ruling elder, uh, kind of not frivolous like so many others uh, in the at that day. And so she said to him, could you not find uh, a wife a good deal closer to home than in that nearby village? <laughs> and of course, he was dropping a big hint. It was her she was thinking of. And he took the hint and they were soon married. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this farm where he grew up, um, uh, he had uh, uh, two uh, brothers who had passed passed away before him, and then he had two other sisters. Uh, anyway, part of this uh, man's story is that um, uh, he um, he's called William Williams of Panty Kellen because uh, he his wife Dorothy. Th this is. Um, uh, back to William Williams, uh, when he, uh, when um, her father um, passed away, um, the farm was left to him as well. So it was an, it, the fact that he had all this freehold property was going to be a significant aspect of financing the work of the Lord in later years. And we'll see why that is necessary. So um, they were in this uh, chapel. Uh, he grew up in this chapel uh, with his, where his father was a ruling elder. But unfortunately, it was not a happy church. Even though they had made a huge commitment coming out of Anglicanism, and in the early days, they'd met in caves and various places until they'd actually were able to get a building. And so uh, th these people were people who had paid a huge price. But what happened was uh, they became very divided. It was a very divided church between Arminianism in Calvinism. The preacher was Arminian and uh, uh, bordering even on Unitarianism. And a couple of the elders were Calvinistic. And it was just a nightmare. It really was. And it ended up a uh, division. And his father, who was Calvinistic, he went out of the church, left the church. But the problem really, and it had a big impression, particularly on William Williams, was that these people who argued there was, he would say, there was too much flesh in their arguing. And it left a bad taste in this young man's life. And so as a result of that, he was not saved, even though he grew up in the gospel context, but it was the bickering and arguing in a divided church that left a bad taste in his mouth. And again, there's a kind of a warning to all of us, isn't it? it, it, it he... he Afterwards, he would contend for the faith himself, but he always said that when you contend for the faith, you cannot allow Amalek, the flesh, to come in because then there's more heat than light and there's a lot of damage. And he learned a lesson very early on from seeing this in this in this particular church. And so um, he was confused. He was grieved uh, by the things that he witnessed and uh, he, he sought to just get away from it all. And so uh, leaving that church, he, he went to try and get some education in another uh, academy. And in those days, again, because they were nonconformists, you couldn't go to a Church of England 
uh, educational center because you weren't part of the the establishment. And so there were these academies that were basically and originally designed to train preachers for these nonconformist meetings, but also was a place where young men could get an education. And he wanted to be a doctor. He didn't want anything whatsoever to do with the church because of what he had seen there. And so he went there, was studying uh, to uh, be a medical uh, doctor. And uh, and yet, because there was such an emphasis on training people for the pre for the ministry, uh, part of his studies included Hebrew and Greek and Latin and uh, <laughs> church history and all of this other stuff. And so, even though he had this great desire actually to be a doctor, he majored on the classics in part of his studies, uh, as well as mathematics and a few other things. And of course, it was all the studies took place in English, even though he was a native Welsh speaker. This would serve him well later on because some of his great hymns were then, he was able to translate them into English. He was a very disciplined student, but again, he had very little interest in the things of God. He, he, you would say that he was a, a, a very self-righteous young man. He'd been raised in a good home, uh, but no real spiritual interest whatsoever. And uh, he, amazing thing happened that one day he was walking back to his lodgings and he saw a man preaching in a graveyard. And out of curiosity, he went to see what was going on. And there was a big crowd listening to this guy preaching in a graveyard. This man happened to be none other than Howell Harris, who was one of the leaders of the Welsh Methodist movement, Welsh Methodist movement. And what was interesting about, he, he'd only been saved himself three years, Howell Harris at this time, but he had a definite remarkable conversion. And because he wasn't an ordained Anglican, but he had such a burden to share the gospel message that he called himself an exalter, not a preacher, an exalter. And so he would go and wherever people would listen, he would exhort them. And his message was simply this, you're a sinner, you need a savior. Christ is the only savior. Look to Christ, call upon him. And so that was Al Harris's ministry. And this young man, William Williams, without a concern for his soul in the world, out of curiosity goes and hears this man preach. And that very day, it was he was awakened out of his spiritual slumber, saw himself as a sinner in need of a savior, and was gloriously saved. That would change his whole life, completely, radically change his life. No more medicine. He decided he wanted to become a preacher. He wanted to share this message that he had heard with such freshness and power, even though he'd grown up with it. It was like so much wrangling, and he was just a clear, a powerful presentation of the gospel. And he was so sick of formality and all the rest of it. He, 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 he finally found reality, and that's what he wanted. And so he began to prepare himself uh, to become a preacher, and ironically, in the Anglican church. Even though his family had paid a huge price to go into nonconformity, to leave the Anglican church, you say, why would a man like this go back into the Anglican church when his parents had come out of it and his ancestors had come out and paid a real price? And the reason was, again, he saw this arguing and this just this kind of formality and no reality. And yet the men that he saw who were real were men like Howell Harris who was still connected with the Anglican Church, and this other man, Daniel Rowland, who was also an Anglican. And these were the only guys who seemed to be preaching with any kind of passion. And it's kind of an interesting note that the Methodist revival largely bypassed the Orthodox uh, nonconformist churches. Largely bypassed it completely. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that sad? It, what it tells us is maybe God could send a revival in our day, and could it be that we could miss it? That God could actually pass us by and use other, what we would say, less scriptural <laughs> uh, organizations uh, to turn the world upside down, because that's exactly what he did at this time. And so there's a lot of practical lessons we can learn from this. But anyway, he uh, he was ordained um, 
in the yeah. Anglican Church, and it was considered to be quite a, a trophy for the Anglicans to get this man whose father was such a well-known ruling elder uh, amongst the nonconformists actually training to become an Anglican minister. And so they really relished the idea. And, of course, he was finally ordained uh, as a deacon uh, in the Anglican Church and uh, in 1740 at um, St. David's uh, by the bishop there. And uh, he, his first uh, parish uh, he was assigned to uh, as a deacon there, he began to preach. And his preaching was greatly blessed of God. In fact, um, Howell Harris, who had been instrumental in leading him to Christ, when he heard Williams preach, he rejoiced at the power of God that was very evident in his preaching. Uh, George Whitfield heard Williams preach, and he confessed, I feel a sweet connection to this brother when I hear him preach. And so, uh, obviously, very gifted, very able uh, in preaching the word of God, but it got him in trouble with the Anglicans. Big trouble, in fact. In fact, the the local uh, superior clergyman was a man called Theophilus Evans. By the way, don't you just love the names that these guys had in those days? That Theophilus Evans. And that sound good. It just kind of runs off the tongue. Anyway, Theophilus Evans was an enemy of what he termed religious enthusiasm. And that was one of the nicknames the Methodists got. They were enthusiasts. Oh, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we were known as enthusiasts? <laughs> uh, sadly, oftentimes we're, we're more connected with lethargy and going through the motions than enthusiasts. But this man, uh, he was an enemy of what he called religious enthusiasm, and uh, he he denounced the Methodists from the pulpit. Now, he's in the same parish. He's the, he's the vicar in the parish that... William Williams is preaching the message of grace, and at the same time, uh, the, the priest or whatever is preaching against this. And so you could see how awkward it really was. In fact, in 1744, Williams was summoned before the bishops to answer for his neglect of ecclesiastical propriety. He wasn't doing things right. A couple of things. Uh, first of all, he was charged of not confining his preaching to his parish. And this was a big accusation amongst these Methodists. They were like the Thessalonians. From you sounded out the word of the Lord. They just couldn't stay. with. If they were needy souls and they were across a parish boundary, they could not resist preaching to needy souls. And so they extended their boundaries beyond the parish uh, recognized boundary. And of course, that got the clergymen in the surrounding parishes all upset and they complained to the bishop. And so he's been basically told off for this enthusiasm of going beyond the parish boundary with his message of preaching. But also uh, when they were baptizing children, which they did in those days, uh, he would not make the sign of the cross in baptism. So that was, a again, a uh, kind of a charge against him and and other parts he uh, he omitted certain parts of the anglican liturgy that were not evangelical and so uh, of course all these charges and it was obvious that he was going to be convicted and so in order to just kind of walk away he basically resigned his curacy before he could be dismissed that meant that from that point on because he didn't have the ordination of a priest he could never administer communion again kind of sad system you know really the whole thing is sad but he was so gifted uh, that the methodists put this man to great use uh, in fact he, he became daniel roland's assistant and so what the methodists did is that they they set up these um le these little groups uh, where the true believers would meet to kind of encourage and exhort one another, uh, these little societies, and he would go around and visit these societies. In the course of his lifetime, he actually traveled over uh, 100,000 miles in Wales. Now, Wales is not that big. Let me tell you that, uh, I mean, it, it, it's really fairly tiny province, but he 100,000 miles going around visiting all these little societies and encouraging them. And what they said about him was that not only was he a great preacher, he was a great organizer. 
He had the gift of administration as well as the gift of preaching. And of course, that's that's what marked the Methodists out. You see, many say that Whitfield was a far better preacher than Wesley. However, Wesley had the gift of administration, and he was able to organize and capture his converts in these accountability groups. And he also had, I just heard recently that yeah, Wesley had 653 preachers that were answerable to him, preaching the message everywhere. So he was an organized individual. And so uh, certainly that was also true of William Williams. He was constant in his visitation. He was tireless in his travels. And um, he was greatly used in the spreading the, the gospel. And of course, as they met together, these key men, Harris and Rowland and others that had been raised up at this time, they were, they, they, their big question always was this, how can we spread the gospel? What can we do to get this message out? And, and this is the difference. Whereas the nonconformists were arguing over areas of doctrine, you know, and fighting over these things and wrangling in fleshly ways, the Methodists, all they were thinking is, how do we get the gospel out? And one of the things they thought about was the, the use of hymns. And so they decided that they would, all of them, try and write some hymns because they realized if you get people singing these things, the truth of the gospel would stick with them. And it became evident at a subsequent gathering that William Williams had the poetic gift. <laughs> and so he uh, was encouraged to write hymns and he wrote over 600 hymns in both Welsh and in English that were greatly used again in that time of revival. What was the time like before they came? Williams describes the years prior to the revival as dark days when Wales was lying in a dark and deadly sleep. <laughs> Sounds a lot like here, doesn't it? A dark and deadly sleep. The early Methodists were men whose eyes had been opened to their lost estate and their absolute need of God to save them by the gospel of the grace of God. And that was the message that they preached. Now, it wasn't that they weren't interested in doctrine. That was not true at all. In fact, he was often involved in uh, trying to settle disputes. But again, as we said, his big message was this. Don't allow the flesh to come in so that there's more heat than light in discussions. Make sure that you just rationally argue from the text of Scripture. So what can we learn uh, from this, this man and um, from his life? What lessons could we learn from the life and work of William Williams of Penticellin? First thing is that the gospel reached him when he didn't seem to have any concern whatsoever for his soul. So that would tell us that the foolishness of preaching is still a method God uses to awake people to their lost condition. They might just come up, walk past and hear a message and one kind of passage of scripture or one scripture text can really speak and wake them up just like it did with this individual, William Williams. The second thing we could say is, it's not enough to be raised under sound teaching or even a do do doctrinally correct home because he had all that. But what he saw didn't move him at all. What did move him was a man who was passionately preaching the gospel. And I think in many of our assemblies, because gospel preaching has fallen into disrepair, we, we hardly ever hear gospel messages it's possible that we're raising people with all the right intellectual information, but somehow that spark of the power of the gospel has just not gripped them. And maybe we need to examine some of those things. See, a lot of these people that um, were raised in this environment, like William Williams, uh, they were, they were self-righteous individuals full of their own, piety in a sense and what they needed was to see their spiritual bankruptcy and that christ alone can clothe with righteousness in williams's hymns 
the great message that he conveyed was this, that Christianity is a deeply personal matter, that true faith is not mere profession, but possession. It's not enough to say that, uh, uh, you know, kind of theologically that the human guilt and all the rest of it, it they had this idea that it you had to it had to be felt. Truth had to be felt. It had to they, they called it experimental Christianity in the sense that it had to be real to the soul. And so that came out in his hymns, that came out in his preaching. It was reality, reality, reality. That was the message. And, and great personal feeling in his hymns. That's why they connect with people so much, even to this very day. He also saw the Lord's people needed to be fed, and the Lord's people needed discipleship. That's why he set up these groups. In fact, I meant to bring with me tonight, I've got a book uh, called The Experience Meeting that he wrote. He authored this book, and he would bring people together, and they talk about their experience with God. Were they growing? Uh, were they having struggles? How were they doing spiritually? It was getting them to talk through the reality of where they were at spiritually, and he he developed these experience meetings that became very useful uh, in, in kind of getting people to take the truth and deal with it in a very real way. He was certainly a man of like passions like we are. He was prone to depression. And uh, and yet, the very depths that he went through at times of depression enabled him to connect with people who also go sometimes through deep valleys. And that often would come out in his hymn writing as well. And so God would use that. The final thing about uh, William Williams' life and work is this, that he saw a vital need for the what he called the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the ministry. He, he felt that you to preach, you need the, the power, the unction of the Spirit of God. It's not just a case of putting a message together and giving out words. He said it can be as dry as anything. You need the Spirit of God to somehow accompany and give life to the Word of God. And so God used this man in a great way to revive a very dry and formal religious culture and bring life to the Welsh valleys. And may God somehow stir us that we might be used as instruments to somehow shake the deadness and the dullness of our generation with the message of Christ and him crucified. Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh, there he is.